um, anticipating that we might have maybe as many people as we had the last time, or maybe even more. And it was pretty cozy in here last time. Um, so we, we actually set up a separate room uh, next door in case we had overflow. So um, I have a colleague over there who's running a separate projector. I think Dave? Uh, <laughs> I guess I can't speak any higher than a very low register. Uh, maybe we won't need you to run that projector in the day. Okay, so I want to welcome you all here tonight. My name is Jay Douglas. I'm with the Oregon Health Authority, and um, and I also have another hat that I wear as I serve as the co-chair for the Pesticide Analytical Response Center, um, which is Oregon's Oregon's answer to addressing pesticide exposure issues in the state. Um, the, uh, this evening, uh, we're here to give you an update about some work we've been doing here in your community related to um, some concerns that have been expressed by um, members of your community about uh, potential pesticide exposures. Um, I'm not here by myself. I'm going to um, ask my colleagues to stand up one by one and call on them and um, introduce them to you. Um, first, uh, with me is uh, a representative from the CDC, which is the federal government, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, ATSDR. Uh, his name is Rick Robinson. Would you stand up here? Um, ATSDR stands for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is why we call it ATSDR. Um, we have quite a few people with us here tonight from the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Elizabeth Allen is here. Uh, Tony Barber, Scott Downey, Alan Henning, back here, back there, and Chad Schultz. Okay. Uh, Mike Odenthal is here from the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Stand up. There you go. Um, from the uh, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, we've got Brian Bowling. There he is, and Greg Pettit. Uh, from the Oregon Department of Forestry, we have uh, Lou Smith yes. and Kevin Weeks. And from the Oregon Health Authority, in addition to myself, uh, Karen Bishop is back in the back of the room. She is waving at you all. Uh, Dave Ferrer, he was, <laughs> he was good for running the project in the other room. And Sue Joppa Joshi. Sue Joppa. There she is. So, uh, so there are quite a few of us here, um, and there are quite a few of us that have been working on this investigation for um, well over a year, or I guess the, the better part of a year. Um, and a number of things have happened over that year. Uh, we've had some other meetings with you in, um, in July of last summer. We came out and had a meeting um, like this in this forum that uh, I said we had a, a big turnout uh, for. Uh, we came out in November and we had an open house uh, just as a chance to give people a, you know, an opportunity to ask questions informally and talk with one another, talk with different members of the agencies. Um, tonight we're going to have a, um, a, a forum that's similar to the one that we had last um, last July with a couple of differences. Now we can take you through that. Um, but for tonight, know that um, the four state agencies that we uh, I just introduced you to, those are park agencies. Uh, PARC is actually not a separate uh, organization. It's a, uh, it's a coalition of, of state agencies. It's a, 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 a joint response center. So there are other state agencies in PARC, but the four that have been involved with the investigation are the Oregon Health Authority, DEQ, Forestry, and um, Agriculture. And then our two federal partners, US EPA and ATSGR. I also want to... Um, I, in addition to acknowledge, uh, uh, introducing ourselves, acknowledge that we have some folks here in the room with us who are your elected officials. And um, it's uh, gratifying and um, important uh, that they're here. I want to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves to you. Uh, I, I, only, I only let one of them know that this was going to be happening because I, I didn't have a chance to, to let them know ahead of time. So the one, the one person I did let know ahead of time, maybe you could introduce yourself first and while the others are, are, are recognizing that that's about to happen. So. <coughs> Hello everybody, I'm Tim Freeman. Uh, I'm state representative from down in the Roseburg area. Uh, my, my reason for being here is I serve as the uh, co-chair of the subcommittee of Ways and Means 
for Health and Human Services. So um, we get to fund a lot of what's going on here. So I'm a little interested in the process and what's going on. Thank you for having me. And I'm Jay Bozovich. I'm the County Commissioner for this area of Lane County. And I'm here because I'm interested in, in seeing a successful execution of a good scientific study So, and finding out what the results are. So let's get started. Um, first, let's talk about kind of how tonight's going to go. We're already through the welcome and introductions. So, right? um, we're going to give you an update. We'll be, we'll be talking at you for a little while. I'll uh, just give you a uh, fair warning about that. There's a lot to explain, a lot to fill you in on, and what's going on um, since we came out here in July. Um, so, we'll talk about that. And we're going to take a break. Um, we have some uh, refreshments from. Um, Alphabet. Alphabet. Alphabet, thank you. Um, Alphabet has brought and donated some refreshments. I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, the folks who've been greeting you at the door. Uh, they're, they're used to that kind of work, and they volunteered their time tonight to, to be greeters for you. Um, so during the break, uh, we'll have a chance to um, go get a snack. And uh, if you haven't already had a chance to do this, uh, write down a question that you have. Uh, or if you've already written down your question and handed it in, we'll come back. We're going to go through a question and answer period, um, and we're going to just take the questions in writing um, and get through them that way. And then we'll take another break. Um, for those of you who want to stay, you're, you're you know, all welcome to stay, welcome and wanted. Um, but we'll have a period of time um, at the end of the meeting that uh, could be the longest period of time, we'll see, um, for public comment. So uh, that break will give folks a chance to kind of get themselves ready. Um, to provide public comment and folks who may not want to stay a chance to, to get on. So that's that's the plan for tonight. Okay, first we'll start with just an uh, update on the explosion. So when we were here um, before, we talked to you about how we were constructing this investigation. And with any investigation, um, it's important to know what it is that you're trying, what questions are you trying to answer? And, um, and these questions up here have been our focal point. Uh, and there are, you know, a lot of people have a lot of interest in this investigation. We understand that. Um, but for, uh, to ensure that we're staying on task and focused and clear about our purpose, um, we, uh, we maintain a focus on these six questions. Um, and of course, first and foremost, the, the, the first question is, are residents of this area being exposed to pesticides? Uh, are they being exposed to pesticides? If so, um, what pesticides are they being exposed to? What, uh, to what extent are they being exposed? Um, and what are the potential sources for those pesticides? Um, are, they, are those sources coming from local application practices? Um, and what are the exposure pathways? The exposure pathway is the different routes of exposure could be inhalation, could be ingestion, uh, could be uh, dermal exposure. So what are the routes of exposure if people are being exposed? Uh, so those are, those, are the, those are those key questions, the questions that keep, uh, we keep our, our focus on. Uh, and so, and we've got a, a number of agencies who've been participating in this, and they all have different roles. So uh, in terms of uh, data collection, uh, we've had, we've been collecting biologic data, um, and environmental data, and then there is uh, pesticide application data. So the, each of the each of the agencies that are represented here have had distinct roles in uh, the collection of those data. ATSDR, uh, CDC, ATSDR, and Oregon Health Authority were responsible for um, collecting the urine data. The urine data that we collected was analyzed by the National Center for Environmental Health um, at CDC. Um, and the re it's being reported out, and we'll talk about that tonight, um, reported out by ATSDR with help from the Oregon Health Authority. The environmental data, the water data, the food data, and the air data uh, were collected by the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in coordination with Oregon Health Authority. Um, it was analyzed by three different labs, uh, the uh, Department of Environmental Quality Lab, the Oregon Department of Agriculture Lab, and the EPA Lab. Um, and those data were reported to the Oregon Health Authority. The application data 
um, has, is being collected by the Oregon Department of Agriculture and the Oregon Department of Forestry. So OHA here, um, as it was designated, um, is the lead agency for this investigation, and so all those data have been coming to the Oregon Health Authority uh, to be prepared uh, for reporting out. Okay, so the last time we were here, uh, we were describing to you how we were going to be doing this investigation. Um, what we originally thought um, was that we would be able to identify an area, um, recruit a number of people, and that that number of people would be the people that we would go back to again and again um, over time. Because we, were, we wanted to be able to collect urine from those people multiple times over the course of a year. Um, and so uh, what we did was we looked at, with the help of um, the Department of Forestry, we looked at the areas where um, clear cuts, those yellow little um, shapes, are representat representations of clear cuts. Um, and de depending on when they were harvested, that set them up for when they were going to be treated. So uh, based on um, the uh, harvested areas from 2010 and 2011, we identified uh, areas in around Blatchley and Greenwood. Green That's Lake. just aerial spraying, right? This Not backpack spraying? This is an aerial spraying, right. Um, and these circles actually represent a mile and a half uh, area around um, those, those harvested areas. So those were our recruitment areas. And uh, so that's what we did. We, uh, we invited people <coughs> to participate. Um, at the point that we were inviting people to participate was last July. And at that point, we didn't, we didn't uh, actually know exactly uh, where the recruitment areas were going to be. So there were some of you who agreed to participate, but that we couldn't include in that round of, of sampling because you weren't within a mile and a half of the areas that were going to be um, treated. So, um, and the, this kind of picture will become very important as we talk throughout the night. So we'll see this, this again. <clears throat> so we got results from the urine that we collected and from the environmental samples. Let me share this with you now. We had um, 66 people who we collected urine from, um, from 38 households in that Greenleaf and Blashley area. Um, those sampling events happened on the 30th and 31st of August. Um, we tested for two chemicals. Um, we were only able at this point to test for 2,4-D and atrazine. These are two chemicals that are used in um, in agricultural and forest practices here. Um, <clears throat> there were no, now I just want to uh, say one thing about this. Um, when we, we were testing for 2,4-D and atrazine at a time when we knew that 2,4-D and atrazine were not being applied. And I wonder why would you be testing for things that you know are not being applied. If you, if some of you who were here before may remember that we were talking about, I was talking about the two kinds of exposures that we worry about um, when we think about people being exposed to chemicals, pesticides being a chemical. Um, one is an acute exposure, uh, where you get a big, big hit of something, and uh, something is a chronic. Another one is a chronic exposure, where you're getting <coughs> steady doses of uh, exposure to chemicals that could be, you know, a health concern. So. Um, the testing that we did in that fall was designed to look at and see if we had a source of chronic exposure that was going on so that there was an application happening. Is there some other source? Is there some other uh, way that people could be getting exposed to these chemicals? So um, when we got back the results, uh, they weren't too surprising, um, but it, interesting. Um, we. We found that atrazine uh, was not present in any of the urine uh, of those 66, 66 people. Okay, I have to take a little sidebar here a second. We're reporting actually out on 64. Um, 66 people were included. We tested urine on 66 people. Two of those people were children under the age of six. Um, we tested their urine and we gave the results to their parents. Um, but because we don't have a comparison group for children under six, they were excluded from the, the rest of the reporting. So as we're talking about these uh, samples and the reporting out, we're talking about um, 64 people. Okay. So uh, there was no atrazine or any of the breakdown products um, in, uh, in the urine. Um, and for the 2,4-D, we found uh, that five of the participants 
um, had uh, uh, concentration, if they had concentrations, it was below level of detection. Six of the participants um, had concentrations above the comparison group, uh, which is uh, the N. Haynes group. Um, now I'll explain N. Haynes in just a second. Um, and we had, uh, we had results that ranged from either non-detect up to 37.33 micrograms per liter. So N. Haynes, um, N. Haynes is the group that we chose to um, use as comparison. It's a, it's a very large national study, the National Health and uh, Nutrition Examination Study, very large biomonitoring study that's been, been running for many years. And in that study, um, they test for pesticides in the urine of their participants. So uh, you, uh, uh, as a comparison group, it works well um, for us to be able to um, ascertain, discern, is something unusual happening in this community as compared with the, this national, this large national sample. So that's why we, use, that's why we refer to it. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through this slide here a little bit. Um, and Haynes, the way that they report out is they report it out in uh, the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, the 75th percentile, the 90th percentile, and the 95th percentile. You, I always wonder why don't they just go straight, you know, 25, 50, 75, 100, but they don't. Um, so we, we're comparing our results to those segments. All right, so what you, what you see here on the left is that 50% of the N. Haynes group um, had concentrations below 0.2 micrograms per liter, or below their limit of detection. Okay, so it was, it was, it was either not present at all, or, or it was just below the limit of detection. In our group, 27% had below the limit of, had below 0.2 micrograms per liter. Okay, so you see how this, this kind of compares up? So in the, um, 50th percentile group, or the 75th percentile group in our room. The next group up, 25% of the N. Haynes group had between 0.2 and 0.23 micrograms per liter. Our group that had uh, 0.2, between 0.2 and 0.23 micrograms per liter were 11% of our group. Okay? In the 75th percentile, right? 20% of the N. Haynes group had between 0.24 and 1.27 micrograms per liter. In our group, 56% had, had in that concentration range. And then last, in the N. Haynes group, 5% had greater than 1.27 micrograms per liter. And in our group, that was 5%. The, the percentages of the total population, or what are we taking percentages of? Percentage of the population testing. So what this looks like is uh, that our group um, is, has a slightly higher number of people who are in that range of the 0.24 to 1.27. For both chemicals? For, for 2,4-D. Because remember, we didn't have any atrazine in our group. So now, this is an important piece of something to know about N. Haynes. N. Haynes um, collects data from communities all over the country. So when you're looking at the N. Haynes group, that's a lot of people. And it's a um, it, it's averaging a lot of the, those concentrations in communities across the country. So there could be communities that look a lot like Triangle Bay, but they get diluted, excuse the pun, they get diluted by the fact that they're part of a very large sample. So from the standpoint of, um, you know, and, and especially looking at that highest concentration of greater than 1.27, our community here, and compared to the N. Haynes group, looks fairly comparable, okay? And again, these concentrations are, are quite low um, and not unexpected uh, from the standpoint of looking at how Triangle Lake, Highway 36, um, uh, uh, community compares. I'm going to ask you, unless you just really can't hold the questions, to hold questions until we get to the Q&A period. Okay. Okay. So um, we'll talk about the environmental samples. So again, um, 
The U.S. EPA collected drinking water, soil, vegetation, and food samples from those 38 households in the same 38 households that the 66, 64 people uh, were living in. DEQ analyzed the, um, the water samples and uh, the ODA lab an analyzed the other environmental samples. Um, DEQ tested for a very large suite of chemicals and that's uh, largely because their laboratory is already set up to, to um, analyze water samples for a very large suite of chem chemicals so it was actually cheaper for them to just go ahead and, and test for everything rather than to just test for the 11 chemicals of concern that we have around here. Um, but that, so that's why um, the ODA lab tested for a smaller number of chemicals, but those are the chemicals that we know are in use in this area in, in forestry. Okay, so um, the drinking water samples um, are represented up here. Uh, there were three different chemicals found um, in those chemicals. DEET, uh, DEET is a common uh, insecticide that people use. Uh, we actually find DEET in a lot of water samples these days. Um, and I'm going to let, I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm let Greg uh, Pettit answer that, answer questions about that if, if you have some. But there were uh, deep, uh, very low concentrations of deep found um, in a domestic well and in uh, little lake surface water. Uh, hexazinon uh, was found in a domestic spring and fluorinone was found in a domestic well. The, the health-based screening values that are up there um, are derived uh, and used uh, um, uh, what we refer to um, from ATSDR or EPA screening levels for drinking water because EPA uh, regulates concentrations of chemicals in drinking water. So we looked at ATSDR and EPA for those health-based screening levels and you can see that um, for DEET in particular, we'll just start there, um, the, the, the screening level is 3,300 parts per billion. We found it at 0 .0047 parts per billion. So variable concentrations of um, in these three chemicals in drinking water. Uh, we also looked at soil samples um, and found uh, uh, two chemicals in three different households. Uh, one household we found uh, both glyphosate and 2,4-D um, in, uh, again, quite low concentrations when we look at the, the screening value um, that we use from uh, that HSGR provides. <coughs> found 2,4-D in the second household, <coughs> and at very low concentrations, and glyphosate in the, the third household. So essentially, what we're so far, we're not seeing concentrations of these chemicals in uh, in drinking water or in the in the soil. Neither did we find it in, in food samples. Um, we tested blackberries, other berries, garden vegetables, eggs, cow milk, honey, vegetation, um, and we didn't find concentrations of any of the chemicals in, in, these, uh, in these samples. Okay, so let me go back on stage. So, so um, where we are at this point with the, um, the fall sampling event is all the data are in now. Uh, folks who participated with us, they got their letters in December uh, for the urine samples. They got their letters for the environmental samples in January. Um, and we are now in the process of taking the data that you've just seen up here and putting them together so that we look at person one from household one looking at their urine data, their drinking water data, their soil data, their, um, their food data, and see if there's any sort of, we can make any kind of sense out of it. There is one other piece of data that um, I, I don't have the results up here for you. Um, we asked all of the 64 people um, to give us some information about their pattern of use of pesticides. So are, do they use pesticides in their home? Uh, when did they use them? If, there are, if they uh, use pesticides as a commercial applicator, they actually couldn't fit in the study. But if they use pesticides at home, um, how do they use them? What do they use? Um, how recently have they used them so that, again, be a way that we can interpret if we're, if we are, if we're seeing concentrations in urine or in their environmental data. Um, that's just another piece of, of, of information. So uh, we will be producing a, um, a, a, a final report uh, that will include both the urine data and the environmental data, and we're looking ahead. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. 
Um, we'll, we're looking out to the summer of 2012 for that report that will include the urine and the environmental data for this, uh, for the, from the fall. Okay, so here we are in the spring of 2012. We were anticipating, uh, as, again, as I said, the fall data were designed to be kind of baseline data. We, we knew that applications of these chemicals weren't happening, um, and we had planned to come back in the spring um, and do that pre-testing. Uh, we were going to be testing um, urine and uh, air in that pre-phase before applications happen and in the and right after an application might happen around them. So we were in the position of needing to figure out, just like we had earlier in the fall, where were the harvest areas and where were applications likely to happen. So um, as we began um, having conversations <coughs> about that, uh, we knew that we had some, um, some limitations, some constraints that we were going to be working with. One is uh, we needed to be able to look for areas where applications were going to be happening, where they were going to be using the things we can test for, right, 2,4-D and atrazine, and where they were going to be applying it um, using aerial application methods. Um, we were going to be doing uh, urine sampling pre and post and air sampling pre and post. So the plan was um, that the landowners uh, who have, have those harvest units would identify the locations and times where those applications were going to be happening. We would recruit people around those areas within one and a half to two miles of those locations um, right be before the spray season started um, in about mid-March. We would come out and collect urine samples from um, the participants and we would leave a second urine cup with those folks. Um, uh, we would let them know. Uh, we would take that their urine cups away, store them at the Oregon Public Health Lab, the landowners agreed that they would notify us when the application was going to happen the day of. Um, we would let our participants know that and so that they would know within 12 to 24 hours of that application to take a second uh, um, sample of urine. Uh, we'd, uh, they'd store them in their home freezer, which we then um, uh, counseled uh, would be uh, perfectly adequate to preserve those samples. Um, we would come back and pick up those samples send them off to the analytic labs, and um, that would be the way it would go. However, <clears throat> this is the area that uh, was identified for application in the spring of 2012. Um, you can see that there are a number of harvest units uh, in the area, and those yellow dots actually represent the 66 volunteers that we had for the fall. What we had hoped was that um, those areas would overlap and we'd be, again have the same 66 people, but that wasn't to be. Um, but as we looked at this, um, the three circles that you see that are in um, orange uh, are the areas where 2,4-D and atrazine were going to be applied, um, and they were going to be applied using aerial application methods. <coughs> What you can't see here, um, because it would have just been really too difficult to, to um, <coughs> as a visual, is the, the tax lot information that we got to see where are people living um, in this area. And as we first looked at that, um, it became clear that these are very remote areas. Um, there are some people who live in these areas. We made a, a very concerted effort to identify all the people who live in this area. We sent out thousands of flyers inviting people to participate. We got, um, again, tax lot information. We got, uh, we converted those to phone numbers. We called people. Um, we simply couldn't get people uh, to participate in the investigation um, in enough numbers to, to go ahead with it. Um, and at that point, that's the reason why we suspended the application, the, the, the sampling um, event in the spring. It was very disappointing, I won't lie to you. Um, but it was very clear to us that um, there were some things that we um, didn't really understand before that we have now come to understand. And that is that the pattern of harvest is very important to um, um, what happens when and the chemicals that are used are really at the discretion of the landowners, and um, they use the chemicals that they, they choose um, based on the conditions on the ground. So um, it, was, it was also pretty clear to us that um, uh, it will be difficult to know ahead of time 
um, where we're going to be able to recruit people from. Um, and the logistics will be something that we're going to have to contend with no matter what. But without enough people in the areas where applications are going to happen, it's simply un in not feasible to go ahead. So. Um, oh, so uh, that's just a, and I guess uh, the last piece is that you can see there are two circles up there. Um, the inner circle is the one and a half mile range that we were shooting for. And we even went out to a two mile range, and we still couldn't get enough people. Um, and beyond two miles, we just didn't really What know section it. are we looking at here? Where's the lake in relation? Those aren't near the lake. The lake. This is down the near um, Junction the City. Oh, actually, it's, it's not even our region. I'm just waiting. What we're looking It's at. not even topographically similar. No, okay. they were chosen by industry because they weren't topographically right. similar and weren't in this okay. area. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, um, we're gonna be looking ahead at, at uh, what are our options next. But one of the very important things, you know, I've just been talking to you about some of the limitations of um, the urine testing. The other um, option that we have for testing is uh, uh, testing the air. When the last time we were here, we talked quite a lot, quite a bit about um, air, and air is the one media that we had to test. Remember, I talked about drinking water, I talked about food and soil, and air was the one pathway that we have not yet been able to test. So um, our our good friends at EPA and at DEQ have been um, working uh, very hard on developing some strategies for doing air testing, and I'm going to ask Elizabeth. Anywhere? to come on up and, uh, well, you know what, are oh, you okay? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> you used to think that was loud and annoying, and apparently it was just a lot of people have trouble hearing me. Can everybody hear me okay? No. How about this? Yeah. Look at that. It's amazing. Um, as Sam mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Allen. I'm a toxicologist, actually, at EPA. You may be wondering, what the heck does a toxicologist know about hair sampling? And the reason I know a little bit about sampling and exposure assessment is because in my normal job, I work at Superfunded. What we normally do is focus a lot on how people can be exposed and methods to test environmental media. So last July, I was here, I remember very distinctly standing up and telling you that I thought it was important, that based on the conceptual model that we came up with here, that we test the air. And because I'm naive, I thought that would be really easy. And it turns out that it really isn't easy. Um, it's kind of vexing, and it's turned out to be a little bit more vexing than I anticipated for a couple of reasons, um, not the least of which is that these compounds typically aren't very volatile. So that's posed a little problems and we've tried to focus the method in which we do the sampling based on, on the conditions on the ground here, the way the herbicides are applied, and what we are going to know about when the herbicides are applied, which is, we, as Jay mentioned, we found out we don't always know when and we don't always know where with very much advance notice. For, for a lot of different reasons, and I'm not going to comment on, on you know, whether or not that's anybody's fault, or it's just the way things are. So there's a couple of different ways to do the testing. One is active, and when we say active, it means that we have something that requires a power source. And there's a couple of ways in which we can do that. Some of you have already been trying to do that. Um, it's a we typically call them a high volume sampler. It's a pretty big contraption. It stands about this tall. Um, it sounds, it has a motor in it that pulls air through a sampling device. It runs generally constantly. It's kind of loud and annoying. It sounds like a vacuum cleaner if you've never heard one. And one of the problems we have with that is that it's not really very portable. And it also requires a power source. And it either requires a power source that we can plug into. It is possible to modify them so we can run them off of usually like a car battery. But that has limited time in which we can run them. So because we would like to be able to have sampling 
you might be able to ha be ready in a lot of different locations. And we don't always, we would, we would rather kind of pick our locations ahead of time because there's just no way with a short notification of when there's going to be spraying that we have the personnel that we can run these things out there and get them up and running in, in the course of just a few hours. It's just not logistically possible. Um, the other thing, and I actually bought a little show and tell. I like this because it looks like a small nuclear device. This is a portable air sampler that we actually designed in Region 10. It has, a, it has a battery at the bottom, it has a motor, a little pump inside, and it pulls air through it. And actually the air goes in here. Could you bring a stool over so we can see actually what you're doing? Well, you can, you can maybe come up and see it later, but... Um. Well, sure. Oh, don't do that. We just, I just wanted to show the inside. There's a little motor, little tubing that goes through from the vacuum pump. And the advantage to this is that it has a little timer fit into it. We think we can maybe, and I say maybe because I've been, I've been admonished by our lab people that these batteries may go as long as 24 hours. If the weather's really cold, probably less than that. Um, the other advantage of that is, though, that instead of just running it constantly, we could set it up to, say, just run two hours a day, or, or, or however we want to do it, a certain interval of time over a day, up until we run out. Um, start doing a little research. It's frequently used for PCBs, um, and I thought, well, if it's used for PCBs, we can use it for these things. It turns out that it's a little bit more difficult than that. It turns out the PCBs are actually more volatile than the herbicides that we're using here. So what we, where we're faced is, we're, we're, in order to do air sampling, we have two hurdles we have to face and, and overcome, and we're working on that. The first is that when we're using an active air sampler, whether this or the high volume samplers, the method for testing herbicides right now is what we call, the method is TO4. That's what the EPA method has been developed to use. There's only two analytes that are currently valid to be tested by that method, and they are, stop me if you've heard these before, atrazine and 2 4 -D. So we run into the same problems with the air sampling that we have with the urine sampling. And that if we're not, if they're not spraying atrazine and 2,4-D, we're not getting a lot of useful information about what's in the air during and immediately following an application. So we're working on a way to, to modify the method to test for the other compounds that are frequently applied here. We have, we, we don't have the spray records yet, but we do have notifications dating back to, I think, 2007, if I'm correct, at all. And it's been remarkably consistent, at least on what they've said that they were going to apply. We don't know what was applied, but it's been about 10 different herbicides that are frequently applied, or frequently listed to be applied on this phone. So we're looking to come up with a way to test for those. So here's what we're faced. If we're doing active sampling, we need to learn how to trap those chemicals that are in the air onto something that, you know, some sort of sorbent media. And I know that's kind of an annoying term, but it's either, typically we use either polyurethane foam, we can use little resin beads, there's some other type of compound. So anyway, the air flows across this material and the chemicals that we're interested in get trapped in this material. So we need to find out which material works best for the chemicals that we're concerned about. And Brian, if I start to misspeak, feel free to tackle me. <laughs> so 
That's the first thing that we need to do. The second thing we need to do is we need to make sure that if we can trap these chemicals onto this media, then we can get it back off. Because it doesn't do as much good to have it on this media and have it stuck there. So we need to know, with a great deal of reliability, how much we can get back off. And once we do that, Actually, the analytical part is fairly straightforward. We know once we get it off into the instrumentation that the labs use, doing that analysis is fairly straightforward. It's done for, other, it's done for, for soil, it's done for water. So that's the deal with the active sampling. We're working on that. I have our lab tasked with doing that part of the research. Um, Unfortunately, they're a super fun lab. They have a lot of other work to do. And they got kind of a late start. They're working on it now. But what, and you're all going to hate me after this, but I cannot guarantee that we would have that ready for the fall. So I don't, I have not even, I was there two weeks ago talking about this with them, but I have not yet been given a firm timeline as to when they will have that research done. But I really believe that doing the active sampling very much limits us going out and getting the information that we want to get. And so we've really been focused on doing the passive sampling and method development, and we would not be as far along as we are today without the energy and the knowledge of Brian Bowling at DEQ. So what we've learned up to this point is that it is possible it has been done for some of these compounds and in other locations. Most commonly, unfortunately, atrazine and 2,4-D, we'd like to adapt it to, to use it for other, the other herbicides that are applied here. But it's going to be a bit more of a time-consuming issue. It's a, it's a bit more of a research project. It's going to take more time and our lab at EPA right now is not able to do that type of research. So, we are looking at, we have an, an arm at EPA called the Office of Research and Development, and as the name implies, this is the type of thing that they do. And we are engaging with them because not only do they do this type of research, but here's the best part, they have the money to do this type of research. But we need to be able to put together a proposal, a process, get that graded, and apply for the money to come up with a method to do this passive air sampling for these types of herbicides. We think it really is something that once we come up with it, we can use it not only here, but it can be done you know, across the country. So that's, the, that's kind of the key that we have to move forward with this. But it is a very, very time-consuming process even to get to the point where we have the money. So to be a little disappointing, but last year I was a bit more optimistic. This year I'm older, I'm a bit wiser. Um, I realized that this is kind of a long process. And it's taking a little bit longer than we all thought it would. To be honest with you, just give me one second, we won't have that money in hand if we have it at all, probably until past December. So it's gonna take us a little bit of time. Um, and I was gonna show one thing, but go ahead and ask your question. Sure, you're talking about testing two substances, 2,4-D and atrazine. The timber companies spray up to a dozen different um, um, herbicides, pesticides, rodenticides, in combination or alone, complete with inerts, and yet you don't have tests for those. There's no way to know what's even going to happen with any of those because nobody has the answer as to what those combinations, in com th those compounds in combination really do. And now you're saying it's going to take more years and more money to even come up with the ability to test for them while the rest of us who live in these environments get sprayed. Why does the EPA just institute a moratorium to stop it until you have the testing methodologies to really uh, prove whether or not these are safe or not. 
Right on. Okay, well, you're right. At the moment, we can only test for atrazine in 24D, which is kind of why we're doing the method development to come up with a way to test for the other ones. So, I can't even, we can't even go to the step of what they're doing in combination until I know what that combination is and whether or not the combination even exists in terms of what's in the air. So that's what we're working on. As far, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to comment on whether or not EPA should put in a moratorium. I'm here as a scientist working on an exposure investigation, and that's the limits of my powers here. So it is what I'm focused my attention on. But I wanted to show this, this slide to give you an idea of some of the, the more vexing problems we're facing. We had a meeting, as I mentioned, at our lab, and it managed to engage a lot of people's interests within EPA in this. And one of the people that attended this meeting, along with my supervisor, was our laboratory manager. And I was trying to explain to him, here's, here's what I need to do this. And when you're talking to a chemist, one of the first questions they're always going to ask you is, well, what detection limit do you need? How low do I need to be able to get this down to? And what annoys the heck out of chemists is when you're talking to a toxicologist like me, instead of giving them a number, the answer is, well, how low can you go? So with that in mind, I went back to the office and I sat down and I looked up some information about how volatile these chemicals are. And I did a little calculation to see under ideal conditions, what's the maximum vapor phase concentration I can have of these chemicals in air? These chemicals are the ones that we've most commonly seen on the spray notifications since 2007. You'll see your, your, the greatest hits, atrazine and 24D. But there's the other ones, and what I did was over in the far right-hand corner, that's the maximum concentration that we can have as a vapor phase. Under normal conditions, probably you'd have a lower concentration, but under the ideal conditions in a closed system, that's what we're going to get. So what you're seeing is for things like hexazinone, mazepir, um, and 2,4-D, it's a pretty low concentration. We're talking either right around the vicinity of one microgram per cubic meter or even less. The two ones that seem to be getting sprayed a little bit more recently or that we suspected are the sulfonylureas, they are really, really, really not volatile. And the concentrations that we would be able to detect in there are very, very low. We think for most of the others, those detection limits are achievable. But we're, it's going to take us, unfortunately, a little bit of time. And quite honestly, I think using our active samplers here, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to test for these things in the air before next spring. Are we so, so as you can see or hear the. Um, uh, the complexity of what we're dealing with uh, in terms of being able to, to um, uh, collect data that can be usable. Uh, that it, and I will say that um, in environmental public health toxicology, we very often don't have biomonitoring data. We almost always rely on environmental data as our source of information to identify and, and um, uh, um, assess what kinds of uh, environmental conditions or environmental contaminants are present and that people might be getting exposed to. Um, okay, so uh, as Elizabeth uh, alluded to, uh, there is a, there's a lot of conversation going on right now about um, what's possible in terms of future air sampling, but that is probably the most active, um, aside from the urine uh, biomonitoring testing, uh, the active air, the air sampling is the most active conversation we're having. Um, we are going to be getting uh, at the, uh, at the end of this month uh, data for application records that, um, or application data, pesticide application data for the previous 
three years. Um, and actually, let me pause for a second because I know this is an, an area of uh, great interest yes. to many of you. Um, and so um, I'm going to ask our friends from forestry and ag to talk about um, the status of the application record request. So. <coughs> Okay. Um, I can touch really briefly on uh, the, and forgive me if I know this information will probably be, be old hat for some in the room, but there are two times when uh, herbicide data is recorded for a forest herbicide application. First is in the planning phase when a landowner will fill out the notification of operation which is submitted to ODF. That identifies the acreage of uh, forest land they are planning on treating Herbicide, and it also has a list of the compounds that, depending under the circumstances, they may intend to use. Uh, it is dependent on, on a number of conditions on which uh, chemical or mix of chemicals they will ultimately end up using. Uh, so that is submitted to the Oregon Department of Forestry prior to an operation beginning out in the forest. Then the next time that that data is captured is on the daily application record that the landowner or the licensed chemical applicator that's, that's performing the application uh, fills out at the time that, that the herbicide is going to be applied. And this is where they will identify exactly what area, what uh, time, weather conditions, and exactly what, what chemical compounds were used. Now, the Oregon Forest Practices Act requires that chemical application operators, they retain those daily application records for three years. And obviously, this is a very important part of the, of the research for the, uh, for the overall multi-agency investigation. Uh, ODF, we submitted letters requesting those daily application records in February. And we actually had a very positive response from the landowners who are in the study area. Uh, we have had a, a, a compliance rate of well over 90% of landowners that have submitted those records uh, to ODF in Salem. Uh, over the next few days, what staff will be doing are, are first of all, uh, digesting what has come in. And we need to cross-check it versus our records of making sure that there's a daily application record that also ties in with a notification uh, that was made to apply herbicide records. We're going to be checking them for their completeness uh, to make sure that the data has been captured correctly and the data especially that's been requested by the science team uh, is going to be present on that document. <coughs> so we have staff will be working on that over the next few days. Uh, we will be transferring that data set uh, to OHA by the end of this month. Now at that time, uh, I know that there are several people in the room who either through they themselves or through an attorney have made a public records request for those daily application spray records. Uh, and those will be fulfilled at that same time that the data is transferred to OHA at the, uh, at the end of this month. So that is, uh, that's ODF's update on that daily application record process. <coughs> ODA's process wasn't quite as uh, straightforward as what forestry's uh, process was. We don't have any notification system required in the Oregon Pesticide Control Act. So we had to uh, evaluate all of our licensees. We have approximately 5,000 licensed pesticide applicators in the state. So we went through and evaluated who may have made applications in this area. First step was anybody licensed as a commercial applicator or a business in that uh, in the business of applying pesticides with forestry as one of their categories was received a letter from us. We also sent letters to public pesticide applicators that are located in the Lane County area who may have made pesticide applications in this area. We also sent letters to what we call private applicator applicators, and those are uh, people who use uh, restricted use pesticides in the production of some uh, agricultural commodity to include timber. So we sent out 421 letters. Um, to date, we have received a fair number of them back. Uh, we've got 
pretty good positive response, especially from the Eric people who made applications to this area. We are currently chasing down a few delinquents because we have some people that did not report back. Most of the ones, as I've, I've looked at them and recognized them, they're people from Eastern Oregon that have forestry and probably didn't come over here. But we're chasing those down. Um, we're also verifying the information that they're sending us. Uh, so we've got to go out and, and do uh, what we call records inspections of a certain percentage um, of those uh, people that we sent letters to to make sure the data they, they provided us is indeed what is correct or that they provided all the records that they were supposed to provide us. Um, I anticipate, similar to what forestry is, that by the end of the month we should have that data set to turn over to health and uh, then they can start going through it. So, uh, all right, so we're planning on future uh, air sampling. We're going to be um, analyzing the data that we get from our colleagues at Forestry and Ag, um, the application records. Uh, we're going to be completing the analysis of the fall sampling uh, conducted that I talked about a little bit earlier tonight. And then we're going to be preparing the report um, for, for release. I'll just talk briefly about the public health assessment, um, that report that's going to be coming out, we anticipate this summer. Um, the data that will be included in that report include the, the biological sampling, the environmental sampling, those uh, application records, um, and uh, it'll include a review of some data that um, is being offered to us uh, by some of your um, your community members here. Um, we'll also we'll, we'll prepare that report. We'll put it out. Uh, we'll be soliciting public comment um, on that report. Take that public comment back, and then finalize the report in, in a final in its final form, probably in the fall. <coughs> okay, so we are now to our our Q and A period. Um, I'm going to um, remind you that we've got some snacks. This is a good time if you haven't already had a chance to write down a question, to write your questions down um, while you're um, getting a snack. Uh, we'll be available to get those questions, and we'll be <laughs> sorting them. I'm sure some of you have the same questions, so we don't want to answer the same questions, you know, six times, so we're sorting them. <laughs> Excuse me. And then come back to that Q&A period in about, uh, I don't know, say, 15, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. <laughs>